What's up? Hello and welcome to the Canaveri Podcast. We are here on this beautiful day uh, with my friend Lester Phillips to teach us a little bit more about the amazing therapeutic powers of CBD. Uh, Since 2015, Lester Phillips has been Canada's leading full-spectrum CBD educator and advocate, delivering informative talks, consultations, hosting conversations with hundreds of individuals and groups. He has an amazing first-person history and experience with the amazing healing power of full-spectrum CBD, and we are lucky to have him here to discuss uh, this with us today. So, welcome, Lester. Uh, We always like to get started with what we call the hero's journey, which is why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your healing journey with CBD and and how it brought to where you are as as an incredible advocate for its power today. Well, first of all, thanks for the great introduction, Eric. I really appreciate that. Uh, my personal CBD journey began in the spring of 2015. I'd, I'd suffered from diabetes too for many years, and I was overweight, low energy, and uh, just an out of shape kind of guy. And the uh, medication that I've been made me weak and often nauseous. So, to, and to complicate matters, I was being treated with benzodiazepines for an anxiety disorder, and uh, I had also acquired PTSD as a result of a couple of traumas in my life. And I, one day I just decided that there just had to be a better way to, uh, for me to live my life. And I figured out that the first thing that I wanted to tackle was the diabetes too. And I, I heard that one could control it through diet and exercise, but my constant craving for sugar and carbohydrates was a, a considerable obstacle. So I, you know, but I, I continued doing my research and I found an article about CBD or cannabidiol. And I learned that there was anecdotal evidence <clears throat> that it might assist in regulating blood glucose levels. Uh, But I was a bit reluctant because I had concerns about THC. My doctor had cautioned me that THC had the potential to exacerbate my my anxiety, make it it worse. Well, at the time, there were dozens of dispensaries not too far from me, and I I figured that maybe going into one of those places was a good place to begin. I hadn't been in one before. I started visiting dispensaries uh, in my search, and uh, <clears throat> the first place I walked into, I was greeted enthusiastically by this young guy with a blowtorch who's saying, hey, dude, come on in for a dab. <laughs> I looked behind me. I thought he had to be <laughs> talking to somebody else. Um, well, ultimately, he didn't have a clue about CBD, and as I went from one dispensary to another, I, I found just about no one else had any CBD knowledge either. So eventually, I walked into a place that had a... Uh, a very nice display of what I learned were hemp-derived CBD products that had so little THC in them that I wouldn't have to worry about any problems with my anxiety. And uh, the products I saw that day were from Canaveri. So I bought a, uh, a bottle of full-spectrum Canaveri CBD tincture and hemp oil. And in the days following, I, I, I started off slowly, and after a couple of weeks, I was dosing a little bit less than 50 milligrams a day. <clears throat> And I, I noticed I no longer had my cravings for sugar and carbohydrates. And that, that meant I was able to make better food choices. <clears throat> and I, I stopped eating impulsively. I stopped binging. And I found my energy was a lot better. Essentially, I wasn't crashing at about 2 or 3 o'clock every afternoon. And after six weeks, I stopped taking my diabetes 2 medication that had been prescribed me by my doctor. So... I kept going back to the dispensary where I bought my Canterbury tincture, and I practically harassed the manager to put me in touch with the supplier. I, you know, I, I was a believer, and I, 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 I wanted in. I wanted to meet the people responsible for this. And coincidentally, Canterbury was looking for someone to get the CBD conversation going. And eventually, we met in person. And, and initially, I, I made it Canterbury to promote the brand in return for my personal supply and and some out-of-pocket expenses. And that's how my relationship with Canaveri began. And that was in the spring of 2015. Well, early that summer, uh, I was diagnosed with a cancer in my jaw. And fortunately, it was a benign carcinoma. But in my post-op checkup with my doctor, uh, he brought attention to uh, some spots on on my temple. And he said that we should keep an eye on it, given my proclivity to, you know, having just got past this carcinoma. And uh, he was afraid it might develop into skin cancer. Oh, I went home and I was thinking, damn, I thought I was out of the woods. And then I I had a little bit of uh, the raw uh, tincture, the raw extract from Canterbury. And I 
I put it on the on the spots on my temple, and in about a week, they literally just fell off. They just dried up and fell off. So as you can imagine, I was I was stoked. You know, I mean, I already felt like I dodged a bullet, yeah. and I it just had me you know approaching my life with a with a whole new you know with, with renewed passion. So uh, you know that summer, my my son and I, and he was 14 at the time. We did as much stuff together as as we could handle, and between my my health issues and his mom and I separating, we we had a lot of lost time to make up. So that summer we were on doing road trips and we were fishing and boating with friends. And but despite all this awesome you know experience that we were having together, I I just wasn't feeling the juice. I wasn't feeling the love. I felt I literally felt dead inside. I could not I could not experience the joy of, of everything that we were, we were doing together. Hmm. And I, I figured it had to be the benzodiazepines. So I made a vow to myself that by September I'd start to think about my meds. And I didn't tell my doctor. Frankly, I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want anybody to discourage me. And uh, all I knew is that my son and I weren't connecting like we used to, and that had to change. So one day in, during the last week of October of that year, uh, my son was visiting me, and I told him that I'd been tapering off my meds, and I gathered up everything I had left, and together we went back to the pharmacy. And I pushed him across the counter to the pharmacist, and I turned to my son, and I said, your old man's all in. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Um, but neither of us had any idea what was going to happen next? Yeah. So benzodiazepines. They are they what? What were they to regulate again? They were to regulate my anxiety uh, predominantly and to help me uh, manage my PTSD as well. So they they're like they, they're are they downers uh, in layman's terms? Are they are they yes. sort of yes? Interesting. Yeah. So I can imagine how that could kind of create a dull sort of sensation over ever like a bit of a blanket over the the highs and lows. I guess that's what it's designed to do, right? Absolutely. It's supposed it's supposed to stabilize your mood. All right. Hang on a sec. Yeah, sure. So I uh, th- the thing is too though, and of course I didn't I didn't know this. I didn't know this going in when I decided to to take her off. Uh, but I had I had met up uh, about a year after that with a with an addictions counselor. And he told me the benzodiazepines were, were a harder with are a harder withdrawal than crack and heroin and alcohol, yeah. wow. and nicotine, and all that. So, uh, you know, had I talked to my doctor about tapering off, he'd have told me to do it over several months to a year, which, you know, yeah, I guess that's, but, but I, I, I just felt I, I had to get on with it. Well, I tapered off in less than two months. So about Amazing. three and a half days after uh, my son and I returned the meds to the pharmacist, uh, just like all hell broke loose. And what followed was an absolute nightmare of cold turkey benzo withdrawal. Uh, I had nausea and seizures and hallucinations and, you know, sweating constantly. I couldn't eat. I barfed for days. I thought I was going to die. And some days I felt like I wanted to die. Um, and that, that went on for, for three weeks. And uh, when I came out the other end, uh, frankly, I... I was. I couldn't believe that I, that I'd survived it. I'd, I'd been too sick to see my son during that time, and but by now it was late November and Christmas was coming, and my son and I had our Christmas time scheduled for uh, mid December. So I was determined to make it memorable, and I called in some favors, bought some Groupons, found a decent hotel in downtown Vancouver for my son and I, and uh, we we ended up having an awesome weekend. We. We went to a, a concert of medieval Christmas music and explored all the seasonal sights and lights and ate our fill at a Japanese steakhouse and saw the latest Star Wars movie and exchanged small gifts, you know, under a tabletop tree in our hotel room. And we returned to our hotel room on the last night. I took off my coat and I, I turned around and I saw him standing there with this big grin on his face. And my boy put his arms around me and he said, I got my dad back. Oh my God, you're going to make me cry too. I just met you, Lester, but wow, that's so beautiful. I, I still can't, I still can't relate that story. Even think about it without getting emotional. It was such a pivotal moment in our life, and 
And I realized, excuse me. Yeah. I realized then our, our relationship had been restored. Oh my God. I'm a father. So this is hitting me right in the, and, and it's, it's, it's so interesting. I think as you get older, it's so easy. It, it's sort of like you're, it's like society sort of, it wants you to kind of, I don't know, like stop, not, not stop living, but stop growing and stop sort of thriving and to, and to put your agency, you know, you sort of, you become part of the hospital system, part of the pharma system. You sort of get shuffled into what everyone else is doing. And, and I think, you, I think it's a, I think your story is such an interesting one because I think there's so many people in the world who sort of have, I don't know, the, the term isn't calcified, but they've sort of like, they've stopped living their truth in, in a way and, it, and, and their relationships suffer and, and everything suffers from it in a way. So it's so amazing to hear stories of people that are able to overcome it. And it's so amazing that this chemical compound, this, this old, this age old, you know, plant medicine it has been so pivotal, you know, for people like this. It's such an amazing story. Well, you know, the, the thing was, too, was that, uh, you know, had, had, you know, I knew then that everything that I'd done to get to that moment was, was wild that I'd done the right thing. And it was all because of Canterbury Full Spectrum CBD. Uh, anybody I, I tell my story to, and I don't know, I probably tell this story maybe 10 times a year. And I still, I, I still get emotional about it. But you know, it's the it's the anecdotal stories that you know we, we can't we can't dismiss them. No. And for me, for me, what made it what made it most important was I felt like I was, you know, I was failing in my role as my son's father. That I was losing him. I was losing our relationship. And I'd seen too many. 14 year olds with no dads, they just went right off the rails. Yeah. There's no way that was gonna happen to my kid. Now, mind you, I didn't know that I still had about a year and a half of post withdrawal to go through. And that meant that every once in a while out of the blue, it could just reach out and slap me around, sometimes for an hour or two, sometimes for a couple of days. Yep. But I kept up my CBD regimen. Uh, by then, with the encouragement of my doctor, <laughs> Who uh, actually turned out to be quite open-minded to the whole thing, and you know, he explained to me. He says, you know, he said these these compounds are powerful medications, and he said people need to give them the same respect that they do pharmaceutical uh, drugs. Right, and uh, so since that time, I've been putting my passion for cannabis CBD into action as as an educator, advocate, brand ambassador, and and relationship manager. And I've, like you uh, uh, mentioned earlier, you know, I've given hundreds of talks to individuals and groups, and it's all along the way to helping people find the best full spectrum CBD available. And, you know, the, the anecdotal feedback that we get from cannabis consumers, it's, it's both humbling and, and rewarding. Uh, yeah. You know, when, when you're helping people live a better life, improving their mental and physical health, their personal progress and productivity and even relationships, uh, there's just nothing better. Uh, what I what I ended up doing after that, because you know now I have my blood glucose, I was managing that effectively, and uh, so that would have been about uh, July of 2018. My doctor announced to me that I had reversed my diabetes too. Amazing! Congratulations! And I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> like. I, I knew I was managing it better, but I'm like, well, what do you mean reversed, right? And he says, well, he says, if I had not diagnosed you with diabetes to in 2010, he said, I'd say you never had it. Unbelievable. And uh, I said, well, I, I certainly feel a lot better. I certainly feel a lot different. And uh, so then, you know, I started to my whole uh, uh, health regimen, uh, you know, working out and exercise and you know, like like I I ended up uh, I'm about 35 pounds lighter than I was in 2015, and uh, my blood pressure uh, was uh, well, last time it got tested it was 112 over 78, and I'm 61. So my doctor's like, you know, you got the blood pressure 25 year old buddy. <laughs> Amazing. And, and yeah, go ahead. And I in the gym five you know five mornings a week, and since April I've ridden my bike uh, just a little over 900 kilometers. So, uh, and my son is like, he gets it. And that's, and that's the beautiful thing. I mean, this experience hasn't been, hasn't been lost on him. He gets it. And 
and uh, it's a it's a great thing for both of us. Not only has it improved your relationship and your relationship with reality uh, as well as with your son, it also just gives him such a good role model as someone who has overcome uh, a number of challenges to 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 be in a place that, that 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 he's really happy about. So that's that's all that you can. That's the best thing you can do for your kids is lead by example. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting you should say that, Eric, because I, I feel very very strongly about that. And because I'd been so sick before, I just felt like I had, I had to do something big, you know. Uh, when I, I used to coach kids lacrosse, and, and I used to tell them when they were like, you know, eleven and twelve year olds, it's like, go out there and do something big, do big things. Yeah. You know, and and now and now it's like here I was in a situation where I I had to finally totally walk the talk, and uh, it nearly killed me, <laughs> but I'm back and I'm better than ever, and yeah. it. It, it keeps getting better, and then Canterbury gave me the opportunity to take to take my experience and 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 you know engage in a process of monetizing that experience. And in that respect, I'm totally grateful to Canterbury as well. A great great support from the founder, uh, and and just you know the the whole Canterbury family in general has just been fantastic. Amazing, yeah, I'm certainly enjoying working with them as well i want to get into canaveri specific i want to get into a little bit about the quality and the you know there's so many different cbd products out on the market but first i'm really curious about unpacking a little bit more about the role because you always have to be careful when you're talking uh in this industry if you're if you're promoting a product that you're only you know that you're speaking about anecdotal things or that you're you're not you're not saying that it's a miracle cure and and, and when i hear you talk about it it's it's it really sounds like a catalyst in your life it really sounds like it was something that was able to uh sort of neutralize negative aspects of your life to the point that it, it kind of g- gave you more power or more agency to make better choices yourself. So what I love about your story is it's really, it, it's it's all about self-empowerment. It's not saying, hey, this thing cured me. This pill came into me and made me whole, made me better. It said this, this, this gave me the strength and power to be a better person myself. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's a, it's a part of my regimen. It's like, I, you know, it's literally a, a, a part of my recovery journey. And, uh, and I, 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 I feel confident in saying that I would not have been able to accomplish what I did without it. I don't know if it's because of it, you know, specifically, but uh, you know those those early results that I that I obtained. First of all, just get my diabetes too under control. I mean that that was huge. Yes. Suddenly, I, I I could I could start to entertain the idea of leading a, a productive life uh, again. And in my past, you know, like I'd i I'd been a, a manufacturer's agent, sales manager, investment advisor, and I wanted so badly to, you know, like I I missed, you know, being out there with my business network and making deals and making stuff happen, right? And uh, this has helped me get back into the swing of things. It's helped me, uh, uh, you know, become a contributing member of society again, for lack of a better word. Um, I. It's not. It's not a panacea, though. You know, it's yes. not a. It's not a cure all, and it's even. It's not for everybody, uh, and I. And I think that's important. And certainly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm moving towards the research right now. You know, in those in those early days in 2015 and 2016, there wasn't a whole lot of scientific research that I could refer to, that I could learn from, that I could you know link people up with who were curious. But uh, it. In 20, early 2016, I came across a study that was done at uh, Hadassah Medical School at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And this study was supervised by Dr. Raphael Matulin, who's known as the kind of like the godfather of cannabinoids. And he was the first to identify and isolate THC and CBD and all this kind of stuff. He's been working with cannabinoids since, what, 1963 or something crazy wow. like that. Well, in, his, in this 2015 study, uh, they uh, and this and this goes into some of the some of the uh, I think some of the questions that you had uh, about different types of CBD as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, they took a full spectrum whole plant extract, which is what the Canterbury CBD is, and then they took uh, an isolate extract. In an isolate extract, they use a, uh, an extraction process called a supercritical CO2, and they can target a narrow range or even specific cannabinoids, pull that out of the plant, but they leave all the other compounds and properties and bioflavonoids, they leave all that behind. Uh, 
And so they had the full spectrum and they had the isolate and they had tramadol. And the purpose of the study was to determine the effects of each uh, one of those on pain and inflammation. And it was, it was uh, and using animal subjects. <clears throat> they found that with, uh, that with the isolate uh, CBD, that there was, there was a bell curve. In other words, they would be administering the CBD, the pain and inflammation would be reducing, 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 and then it hit an apex, it hit a peak. And then after that, no matter how much was administered, uh, it was, there was no further relief. Hmm. Whereas with the full spectrum, the more they administered, the more relief. You just get right on going, straight up. Turned yes. out that it was also more effective than tramadol. Which is a barbiturate. Well, which is, uh, it's not, I, don't, I don't know if it's a barbiturate. Oh, okay, but it's, it's a painkiller. It's a painkiller and anti-inflammatory, right? Okay. So, uh, so essentially it blocks pain impulses. Mm. Where, whereas the, the, the uh, CBD doesn't block the pain impulse, it reduces the inflammation that causes the pain, and the pain reduces in that, in that respect. Uh, the cool thing, too, about, about CBD is that it's, uh, you know, unlike uh, pharmaceutical preparations, it's a lot more friendly to your, to your liver and your kidneys and things like that, right? So it's, yeah. a lot, it's, it's, not, it's not toxic, essentially, to your body. And uh, in, there's studies I've seen where they've administered as much as 1,500 milligrams a day to human subjects with no negative effects, no negative side effects or nothing like that. So essentially the, 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 the message is that you can't overdose or, or, or harm yourself uh, by, by taking CBD. Now, the other key difference between the full spectrum products and the isolate products is uh, the amount of time that they're effective, the amount of time they stay in the body, the health, the, the, the half-life. So a nice little will, will hit the subject, it'll hit the user quickly. So you, you'll, you'll feel it quick. But its effects are gone in two to four hours. Mm. And within eight to ten hours, it's excreted out of your body. So you have to keep loading up to keep the same effects. Uh, a full-spectrum um, CBD, whole plant extract, um, its effects are six to eight hours. It takes about two or three days for your body to excrete it. And it resides in the fatty tissues in the liver. So after, you know, I tell people, you know, it's like after a week or so, if you're taking your regular dose, you're going to get this kind of happy medium in your body. And, and your CBD is going to be, you know, excreting gradually into your system. Uh, some people get relief from a myriad of different things for as little as, as five milligrams, but... The accepted therapeutic doses are over 100 milligrams a day, but most people are just fine with uh, with 50, just kind of like as a little extra insurance. So, you know, like 40 to 50 milligrams a day of, of full spectrum CBD will do the trick for most people for pain and inflammation, uh, uh, you know, minor, minor anxiety. Like, you know, if you if you're if you're totally sweating it out and you think CBD is going to be the miracle cure for your anxiety, well. First of all, if you're on any other medications, you got to get you got to get off those, and you've got to give yourself time to to clean your body up from that. Uh, and the the interesting thing is too, though, is that uh, CBD competes for the same liver enzyme, the, the uh, P450 enzyme, that metabolizes about 70% of pharmaceuticals. Hmm. It's also the same uh, enzyme that metabolizes THC. The thing is, is that CBD is the dominant compound in this case, and it basically monopolizes uh, that enzyme to metabolize itself. And until it's done, nothing else gets metabolized. So, uh, you know, if somebody's having a, a problem with THC, you can dose with some CBD and it's going to take that edge off. Uh, uh, at the same time, pharmaceutical, it could either slow or hasten the metabolization of those pharmaceuticals. So in the case of people who ask me about, well, you know, I've, I'm having cancer treatment and I wanted to try CBD. Well, if someone's taking chemotherapy drugs, they shouldn't use CBD because it'll slow down the metabolization of those chemotherapy drugs. People will maintain their regular, you know, dose of the chemotherapy drugs. And because it's not metabolizing as quickly as it should, it can actually build up to toxic levels in your body. So this is why people have to have individual conversations with their doctor or a professional health care provider. 
And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor or any, anything like that. I'm just a guy who, you know, has a great anecdotal story and a guy who's, ex, who's explored all the research that's available online. And since 2015, there's a lot more CBD research. You know, I just, uh, this week, I referred a guy to three different studies that had to do with CBD and macular degeneration. You know, he's, uh, he's an older guy and his, his eyesight's going. And he was uh, looking to see if there's some way that uh, CBD might help that. And it turns out that there's three studies that indicate that it could uh, potentially slow down macular degeneration by reducing inflammation. Um, I, I have uh, some of the other anecdotal stories I've heard that people have told me. There's a, there's a, a woman I know who's been a huge fan of Canterbury's full-spectrum capsules for, uh, for a couple of years now. And uh, she, she you know, ran out of her, her supply and was, hadn't bought any for a while. And the neighbor said to her, man, are you ever bitchy lately? <laughs> Happens to the best of us. So what's what's going on, right? And she goes, oh well, I I, I don't know. And she said she started thinking about it. She goes, well, I haven't had my CBD for a while. Um, quite often, people say to me, "How do I know it?" And I'll say, "When you stop taking it." Yeah. <laughs> and 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 that's that's the best way to to describe it to people with a, with a purely full spectrum product, uh, because you you find. For most people, they start to, it's, it's very subtle, it works very subtly, uh, whereas the isolate will work quickly, but for a short amount of time. But with a full spectrum product, it's very subtle. So you're looking at about, for most people, you know, by the time they get to their third day, they're going like, oh, whatever it was was bugging me, uh, whatever, right? And they just keep on going. And then some people, they say, oh, I feel great, I'm going to stop. And then three days later, <laughs> they're starting to feel achy or anxious or you know, or cranky again. And uh, so that's, that's why I always use that. You'll know it's working when you, when you stop taking it. Yeah. And then you'll notice it. And, and I think it's key that it's, that it's a regimen thing, right? It's a, it's a medicine. It's a daily thing. It's something that you, that you build a, a relationship with, figure out your cadence with it. Like what, talk about your regimen. Like what, what do you, 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 how do you build it into your day specifically? Well, I, I, uh, I start off, I take, I take at least 50 milligrams every evening. So I take it before I go to bed, and uh, it's it'll kind of I I still experience a degree of uh, anxiety in the evenings, and it just sort of takes that edge off and helps me clear my mind and get to sleep. In water or uh, under the tongue? I I just swallow the capsule whole. Sometimes oh, capsule, I take okay. a little bit of yogurt because it, it it helps the fat content in some foods helps metabolize it better. Mm. Uh, for a tincture, you would you would just take a a, a dropper under your tongue, sort of swish it around and then swallow it, that sort of thing. Um, uh, I, I find too, there's, well, there's another story I heard recently, a friend of mine, his, his father's uh, got peripheral nerve damage in his feet. And I don't know if you know what that's like, but it, it, it makes, it feels like your feet is, are, are burning up. It usually starts to, to uh, start up in the evening before you go to bed. So it can lead to, you know, lack of sleep and can keep you awake and all that stuff. Well, this guy had been taking 50 or 100 milligrams for other stuff and was fine. He upped his dose to 150 and he doesn't have the peripheral nerve pain anymore. Oh, uh, that's, I mean, so now his quality of sleep's improved. He's not experiencing that pain. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful thing that way. Um, and then on the whole idea of, of dosage as well, keeping in mind that these whole plant full spectrum extracts you know they're not uh, they're not refined into a, a you know into like pharmaceutical uh, uh, grains you know that that sort of thing so uh, be, because of that because it's, it's a organic it's a natural product and it's it's as close to its natural state as it's as it's going to be it's really really difficult to make specific recommendations as far as dosage and, and titration so, it, so I, I encourage people, you know, to start slow. If they're using a tincture, for example, I'd say, well, you know, start with start with one dropper. Do that for two or three days. You know, just take note of what it feels like. Maybe up your dose, and you know, just find find a happy medium that way. Or with capsules, I say, you know, like uh, get started with one capsule a day and up that as you go. 
right? And then until you reach your uh, your desired effect, uh, because everybody's metabolism is different. You know, young people versus old people can be can be different. Your condition can be uh, you know uh, worse or not as bad as another person's. Uh, you know, so you might require less to treat that tradition that that condition compared to somebody else who, like this gentleman with the uh, with the peripheral nerve pain, mm-hmm. right? Um, I know some MMA guys who use the product on a regular basis just for aches and pains in the gym. Yep. Uh, and again, they found when they stopped taking it, <laughs> all those aches and pains come back. Yeah. So, uh, so it really, it really is a an individual uh, uh, kind of situation, and ultimately, it's it's the individual who figures out what what works best for them. The only alternative. To that, like if, you know, when people say to me, "Well, you know, I really want to know exactly how much I want to take and stuff like that," it's like, "Well, maybe CBD is not for you. Certainly not a full spectrum CBD. Maybe you should be looking at some kind of uh, uh, some kind of a short term uh, effect, like an isolate, or maybe you should just be going back to pharmaceuticals or over the counter painkillers or or something like that." Yeah, to go a little bit further on on the full the full spectrum of whole plant approach that Canaveri has. That, I, that another thing I like about them. Is that they are seed to sale in that they are they are actually you know they have the land mass to to grow this stuff in the U.S. Uh, and in Canada and they're growing it they're tending the crop it's it they're 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 growing specific strains that they've tested with, with people uh, and then all the way through it's their product versus maybe buying odds and ends from different um, distributors and things like that I I think the the holistic process that Canterbury brings to the table I think is something that really helps with the the overall quality potency consistency is that something you'd agree with absolutely Canterbury's commitment from seed to sale is just you know, I, I I can't express how how important I think that is you know like I I when when, when you think about it you know like we got guys on the ground that are journeyman growers who are out there you know Given the love to their crops, they're the guys that are cultivating it. Then we got the guys who the who are the uh, you know on the extraction team. They know what they're doing. They found the best extraction method that yields the the, the fullest spectrum CBD available. Um, and and ultimately they they they've come to a point now where they they are able to get uh, what they believe is the most potent extract in, in the end compared to. Using other methods that, uh, that were originally tried, so actually over the years, uh, Canavir has perfected those extraction methods, and also the percentage of CBD in the raw biomass—that's the actual plant itself—you uh, know, over the years continues to go up. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, they might have been growing something that was in the eight to ten percent range. Now we're in the high teens. Probably this crop that's going to come off in the United States in uh, um, probably in 2020, certainly in uh, yeah in 2020, it's going to be over 20 percent. Wow! So there's you're never going back. And in in December of 2018, uh, the the U.S. president signed the the new agriculture bill the farm that bill. addressed uh, yeah that addressed hemp cultivation. So there's going to be a lot more people in the space. They are going to be, you know, trying trying to get in the business, and uh, that's that's a mixed blessing. Uh, but I think in the end, it's going to lead to better better product because you're going to have greater competition, and you're going to have more people taking it to heart because they've made a big investment in it. You know, one of the things that uh, I think there's one one caveat not to do with uh, hemp CBD production in Canada or the United States, but uh, CBD uh, products that originate offshore. Uh, hemp is a the hemp plant is a great detoxifier. Uh, you know, it's been planted on radioactive sites because it sucks toxins out of the earth. So imagine if you're the contractor who's planted all the stuff and you've got all this tonnage of of hemp now, and you're thinking, well, do I just throw it away? Do I burn it? Well, you know, some place in Eastern Europe or something like that. I mean, people have been turning it into isolate and, you know, shipping it overseas. And there's a lot of offshore isolate that's found its way into the North American market. Uh, you know, that's that's a concern. I mean, we had, there was a guy at a lift conference here in Vancouver a couple of years ago who uh, had uh, was had some isolate that he was 
um, trying to get into the system. And it was it wasn't it wasn't even white. It didn't even look pure. It had like a mm. like yellowish brownish tinge to it. And even people who otherwise were, you know, cool with isolate were like, you know, I'm not going near that, right? I'm not going to say where it came from. No. But there's a lot of uh, jurisdictions in the world that, that grow hemp uh, that don't have the same uh, commitment to the environment and to, uh, you know, certain agriculture and cultivation practices, like in the case of Canterbury, Canterbury is committed to uh, to a veganic approach uh, or, you know, jurisdictions that allow the, the use of various pesticides and herbicides and there may be heavy metals in the soil and all that stuff. And that's why actually uh, uh, China is uh, is the next big market and they're, they're looking for CBD products from North America because of quality. the quality because of the quality control. And uh, that's, that's the, the thing with, with isolate is that uh, you know, some, some products will be able to provide you uh, with, uh, you know, with kind of like a paper trail showing where the stuff originated, what the, what the biomass was tested at, what the extract was tested at, what the finished ice product was, was tested at. Not everybody does that. Uh, Canterbury tests every crop that comes off and it goes to a third party lab, which is really important because the third party lab, they don't have a vested interest. You're paying them a flat fee to do your test, the same fee that everybody pays. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of places have uh, an in house lab and they try to publish the results from that. And, you know, there can be, a, I'm not disparaging that, but there is a potential for a conflict of interest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just thrilled to be, you know, working with, with Canterbury just, just to have such a quality product, have something that the world is ready for. I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, it's funny, almost everyone I like I, in my circles, my parents, my grandparents, uh, people are talking about CBD. Their friends are talking about CBD. They're, they're hearing it from Dr. Oz. They're hearing it all over, but it's still, there's still so much room for growth in this space. I'm, I've, I've heard as much as it could double within the next five years or even more. Where, what are your hopes for the, the CBD revolution uh, worldwide? Well, <laughs> so there's no question about the potential for growth. And the question is the, the, uh, the, the, the need to ramp up current production, extraction, and manufacturing of CBD products. That's, that, you know, there's a lot of logistics there. There's a lot of supply chain stuff involved. Uh, it means that to meet the demand, and on a global scale, there's going to have to be a heck of a lot more high CBD hemp cultivated uh, and around the world for that matter. But again, I, you know, predominantly North America, North America is, is the envy of other jurisdictions. Uh, going forward, however, um, you're going to see some, uh, some, a lot of progress made in places like Mexico. You know, Mexico has a long tradition of uh, of related cultivation, and uh, they, you know, they're they're willing to partner with uh, with international partners to to you know update their expertise and uh, help them gain uh, new knowledge and and distribution. Uh, so you know, so when I say North America, I'm really talking about Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. There's a there's a, there's a huge opportunity for. Uh, businesses within those three countries to to work together and uh, you know help help bring the, the best the best product on the globe to market. Nice for this for the seemingly never ending demand that that seems to be out there. Uh, and then my job is to help find bring it to pe bring the brand and bring this working with you. I'm really excited about that because I think there's more that we can do together to help bring this brand to the world uh, digitally through through the, the the online marketing methods that I know. Uh, I'm just really excited to be in, yeah, a space that is so impactful, so much room to grow, and so positive generally for the world. I wanted to just briefly, I, I, we, I know you don't have a forever today, but I, why has it taken so long, do you think? This, this product that is so powerful for people, so impactful, why do you think it's sort of, what, what's a little bit about the history for a reason why this hasn't been around since, why haven't pe people been talking about it and using it more since, since much earlier? Well, for starters, I mean the old the old hemp strains. Even though the predominant cannabinoid, you know, may have been CBD, it was there's no research to it, and the levels were really low, anyways. And that's why it was used for for fiber, right? 
fiber and animal bedding and, and stuff like that. So there, there was no real incentive. Interesting. And, uh, but the, you know, the modern, the modern strains, uh, came, uh, in, in, in response to USDA regulation that stated that for a plant to be classified as industrial hemp and not cannabis, it had to be less than 0.03% THC. So, you know, all the biomass that's being grown in North America right now meets that requirement. And, you know, some of it off the field is like, you know, less than a percentage point, mm. right? So, but through, you know, through working with the genetics and whatnot over time, uh, you know, people have been able to put together these high CBD strains right now. They're, you know, like the ones that we're using, and like I told you, we're you know, bumping up around 20% now, and that's... And that's going to change again. It's, that's going to that's going to be the the old standard, as 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 it keeps going up. Uh, there was a stigma, I, I would think, too, for for a lot of for a lot of people because, and for people who didn't want uh, uh, the uh, experience of THC, um, like myself originally, that would make them somewhat apprehensive. I totally understand that. I get that. Uh, and then, of course, it would just come down to you know, the availability. Well, once the once you know research started to pour in and, and grow, people saw the potential for it. Um, that's the reason we're starting to see what's happening now, right? Because you know they're they're paying for research and there's scientific organizations that see this potential and they're saying, oh well, let's you know let's find some money, to, uh, you know, from uh, let's find some funding so that we can uh, do this research and see how CBD works on this this condition or this ailment or whatever. Uh, the other thing that's driving it right now, like you mentioned, Dr. Oz, you know, I mean, there's, there's CBD house parties, you know, I think the, the Kardashians are doing it. And, mm -hmm. you know, so there's, there's all these different channels, all these different sales channels that are, that are opening up. But again, it really comes down to supply and yeah. quality control. So, you know, you can't, if you just, if it just kind of explodes overnight, then that's when you that's when you have the, the potential for quality control and, uh, you know, to, to take a hit. And that's, it's keeping that in mind is one reason why Canavari has moved forward one step at a time. And, you know, we're really close with, uh, you know, with growers in Canada and the United States and, you know, originally in Colorado. And, uh, you know, the, the amount of knowledge and expertise in the Canavari team in this, in this field is just remarkable. There's so many different uh, opportunities for people in the CBD space right now who are interested in working with it in some way. I mean, obviously, there's, you know, like we uh, touched on earlier, this whole concept of seed to sale. Even if uh, somebody wants to get involved with an operation that's not, you know, let's say, for example, specializing in one of those things along the way, there's lots of opportunities in there. You know, you've got people who are excited at the idea of uh, agriculture and cultivation. You have uh, people with, uh, you know, some people with an engineering background who want to get into uh, extraction technology and that, that kind of thing. Uh, you have people that are, you know, marketers and uh, product developers, uh, you know, brand ambassadors, educators and advocates, uh, you know, retail wholesale distribution, you know, in different different uh, jurisdictions. I mean, it's, it can differ from one state to another in the U.S., and things are still in development here in Canada. And so, you know, I mean, we, we, we hope to see the availability of, of true full-spectrum, you know, little or no THC products in Canada later this year. That would, uh, that would be a great thing for the Canadian consumer. Um, and then, you know, there's opportunities in in. Uh, international finance and domestic finance, uh, you know, putting together joint ventures and, and, and agreements with people that, you know, bring various uh, things to the table and uh, one, so there's, there's great opportunity and great potential, regardless of what a, of, uh, what a person's uh, experience is, you know, like whether you're in sales or public relations or product development or agriculture or you know, all that stuff. There's all kinds of things. In that respect, it's no different from any other business because, mm. you know, every business has all those, you know, little niches along the way to make to make it go, to keep the supply chain humming and get it to market. 
you're a perfect example of it as someone who just fell in love with the product and then found a way to be involved with a, with a great organization. So I wanted to basically end it there, but if, if you're out there looking to get involved with CBD, if you're, if you have um, one of these ailments that where the root causes inflammation or, or any of these other things we've discussed, uh, what do you recommend people do? I guess, I guess if they're on medications, it's really important that they go and speak to their doctor, but if they're otherwise healthy, do you see any limitation in them just giving it a try? No, not at all. You know, you might, you might find out that there was something you didn't even realize was bugging you a little bit that isn't anymore. Uh, you know, one, one thing, I, I, I met a couple of uh, college students at University of British Columbia uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, this young fella and a and, and young woman, and they were both uh, methylphenidate users for, for study, you know, Ritalin. Okay. And uh, they got introduced to cannabis CBD. They got introduced to CBD, and they found that it calmed them and allowed them to focus. And they had this, you know, this low dose kind of thing, right? They didn't, they didn't need much. And they found that for them, it was a greater study aid than, than methylphenidate, which is a popular, uh, you know, popular for with a lot of university students because it, you know, it's, it's reduces it's your anxiety speed. a little bit. And yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, 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 it's always a, surprised me with Ritalin right. is that, is that it's a upper, it's this sort of thing that's, it's, it's actually like a, it's an accelerant. It's, a, it's, it's, it's basic, it's a form of advanced speed in a way. Uh, whereas CBD is like the opposite. CBD just, you know, yeah. I feel like it sort of slows you down, calms you down, you know, makes your focus a little more singular. Uh, and I know it's yeah. not an epidemic, but I know that there are, you know, it's a huge, huge thing with, with kids today on college campuses for sure. Yeah. We had uh, we had a uh, thing here in Vancouver too a couple of years back uh, where there was a local dispensary that was supplying full-spectrum CBD uh, to a, uh, a street drug user outreach program. And uh, you know, this was this was in reaction to the opioid overdose epidemic. And uh, you know, the downtown east side here in Vancouver is a pretty you know a, a, a pretty terrible place for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Desperate and, place, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people there that have uh, you know they're trying to cope with traumas and addiction issues and, and stuff like that. And uh, the idea, of the the director of this program. Her idea was that if CBD would stop one of her clients each day from not using some kind of synthetic opioid, then maybe she could save their life. So, and and I, I, I gave a talk to that group on the downtown east side. They had a room full of their clients, and these are all, you know, ninety percent of them are people who live on the street, or um, <clears throat> and. I had this one fellow perk up and tried to sort of derail my talk. And he said, yeah, he says, well, you know, what good is this stuff if it doesn't get you high? Right? And I said, you know what? I said, think about what you just said. He said, why do you want to get high in the first place? And I remembered what a buddy of mine told me. who had been a heroin addict for 20 years. He told me, he says, whatever pain that you have, whether it's in your head or your heart or your soul or your body. He says the heroin just took it away. And I said this and I reiterated that to this fellow and, and I said, isn't that your reason too? And he started stammering and everybody in the 